My name is Amani Wazwaz. I teach communications and literature at Moraine Valley Community College. I was nominated by Troy Swanson to take the Democracy Challenge, where I should be describing what democracy means to me, where I see the hope, and where I see possible threats. In describing what democracy means to me, I can't help but be informed by my love of books and my love of teaching writing and literature. For me, democracies thrive the most when people are very comfortable being storytellers, sharing the details of their joys in how they're being governed as well as their sorrows. I see democracies thriving when people are storytellers narrating the details of their lives. To my mind, when people have control over the narratives of their lives and they're making meaning about the different chapters of their lives, they feel most at ease and peaceful. Very much connected to people being storytellers, whether they are verbal storytellers or telling stories, their own stories through writing, is their roles as readers. I find that democracies thrive so much when people are also readers, readers in the true sense of the word, where they are taking a text, whether it be a novel, a short story, a poem, or a post online, and carefully paying attention to the words and the meaning intended by the original author, and feeling at peace and feeling very free to make connections between different texts and to unpack the original words in a very ethical way. Where else do I see democracies thriving? When democracies provide a variety of different platforms and institutions where people feel very comfortable discussing this literature with one another, in the process of discussing the literature, and by literature I mean historical texts and scientific texts as well too, and a variety of different texts. They're paying careful attention to what other people are saying, ethically taking into consideration their ideas and then responding to them and deepening the knowledge and keeping the culture going and developing it further and further in order to benefit humanity. To celebrate the love of reading and the love of books, I would like to please share with you a small uh, selection, a few lines actually, from Carl's, uh, Carl, Carlos Ruiz Safon's The Shadow of the Wind. And Safon has the following to say on page five. So the book is about the young boy, Daniel, and Daniel's father takes him to the cemetery of forgotten books, and Daniel's father has this to say to him. He says about the cemetery of the forgotten books, this is a place of mystery, Daniel, a sanctuary. Every book, every volume you see here has a soul the soul of the person who wrote it and of those who read it and lived and dreamt with it. Every time a book changes hands, every time someone runs his eyes down its pages, its spirit grows and strengthens. What a beautiful, contribution idea to the power of reading it is the readers who give life to the book it is the writers who have written the book who have given their souls onto the pages onto the words and it is the readers 
who keep the culture within the books alive and they keep it going. Beautiful love of reading. This, to my mind, is how democracies continue and thrive through the exchange of culture, through the exchange of knowledge, through the exchange of respectful argument and debate and analysis. However, where do I find the threats? I find the threats happening when cultures, when people stop reading and debating and analyzing and, and truly taking ideas into consideration. In talking about the cemetery of forgotten books, Daniel's father has this to say, and it's on page six, and Sufan says, when a library disappears or a bookshop closes down, when a book is consigned to oblivion, those of us who know this place, and by this place, he means the cemetery of forgotten books, its guardians, Make sure it gets here, it gets to the cemetery. In this place, books no longer remembered by anyone, books that are lost in time, live forever, waiting for the day when they will reach a new reader's hands. There are books that are forgotten. There are cultures that are forgotten. There are books cultures that are dismissed, their books, their ideas, silenced, considered, you know, not valuable. This is very unfortunate. And this is where I see democracies begin to die when certain, certain groups are deemed more valuable than others. I sincerely hope as Daniel's father says here, that loving hands will find access to these books. I want to also add the following. I mentioned how a certain people become silenced. They become marginalized. What adds to the, what, what adds to the tragedy and what also adds to democracies dying is when these marginalized people feel that they should also silence themselves. And I would like to share with you Discipline and Punish by Michel Foucault. And I want to dry, uh, draw from his idea of the panopticon in the silencing of the masses, in the silencing of the people. Michel Foucault talks about the 18th century where there developed this idea that in prison cells there should be the panopticon or the tower and in this tower there is a watch guard and the prisoners don't know if they are being watched so this was the method to control them the prisoners are thinking either they're being watched or not no matter what the mission is they are going to end up disciplining themselves and correcting their own behavior. So in other words, the oppressive systems become inside of the mind of the people who are oppressed or who are marginalized. This is a tragedy. In my mind, I see that people who are silenced or are marginalized, not all of them, thankfully, but some of them take the silencing into themselves and discipline themselves. So in other words, the watch guard, the jailer becomes inside of them. There's something else that I've also been thinking about ever since the start of the pandemic. Like a lot of us, what's gonna happen to us? What's gonna happen to our democracies? And I think a lot about the story, um, the writing of Naomi Klein in particular, her article, and her article is called A High-Tech Coronavirus Dystopia, and Naomi Klein fears the following. She fears that since 
we are already at home and there is a portion of us that are working from home and others who cannot afford to stay at home. She finds that big tech companies are going to force their vision of keeping us at home and turning our homes into our prisons so that our homes stop pe being our own private spaces, spaces of rest and contemplation and reflection. You know, we're already at home, particularly for us. We're already teaching at home and our students are learning from home. So why not stay there? I hope not, but this is what she says. It's a future in which our homes are never again exclusively personal spaces, Naomi Klein writes, but are also via high-speed digital connectivity, our schools, our doctor's offices, our gyms, and if determined by our state, our jails. So hopefully this does not happen where our homes become our prisons and our minds are taken over, where we discipline ourselves because we constantly feel we're being watched. So democracies are threatened to my mind when a population stops reading, critically analyzing, having peaceful discussions and a give and take. When, you know, a portion of our population or portions of our human populations feel that they should silence themselves or they're not free to be themselves because we're being watched. Or perhaps when a pandemic like ours, you know, you know, has taken over and others want to exploit it. This is my take on it. Now, I would love to nominate the following to take the democracy challenge. First up, Margaret Lehner, can you please take the challenge? Chris Matuzek, Randy Connor, Tiana Richards, Jenny Lamb, can you please consider taking the challenge? Thank you so much.